now, a Fox 8 News special report. Disappearing defenses. Here is your host, John Snell. In a cypress stand near Des Almonds, Arthur Mathern looks for a monster. A 13-foot alligator he has nicknamed Big Al. Most gators this size is 700, 800 pounds. I'll go to 1,000. Big Al serves as the main attraction on the boat tours Mathern runs through the Cypress Swamp. Just like a pet. That big that tail is. Mm -hmm. the wide, how wide that tail is. He's, he's pretty, pretty tame down. We got a mutual agreement. I'll feed him. He don't eat me. A perfect arrangement, maybe. But in the surrounding marsh, the balance of nature has been upset. If you didn't know what it looked like 30 years ago, it's completely different now. Arthur Mathern has lived Louisiana's coastal land loss, a geologic age unfolding before his eyes. Few places on the planet lose more land than coastal Louisiana. Wars have been fought over smaller stretches of real estate than have vanished in less than a century. An entire ecosystems in a state of emergency. And for man concerned about hurricane protection, it means disappearing defenses. On Bayou Terrebonne, south of Homa, Myron and Tammy Otama worry about a future with the Gulf of Mexico at their doorstep. In a few more hurricanes, uh, we won't have anything left here anymore. Right. You won't be able to see this anymore. It'll be, maybe it'll be camps, but yeah. it won't be homes. A series of hurricanes and tropical storms spawned a sense of urgency. With the wetlands gone, houses took on water in areas that would not have flooded in relatively minor storms of the past. Since the 1930s, geologists say the sea has swallowed nearly 2,000 square miles of the coast, like losing six Jefferson parishes. And it's not as if it was completely by surprise. An 1897 National Geographic article debated the wisdom of robbing the marsh of the annual spring floods starving the land of the mud and silt that had built and maintained South Louisiana. Engineers of the day deemed that loss to be worth the payoff. Better navigation, more commerce. I mean, they took the levee system in the Mississippi River and they channeled everything to the Gulf. The cancer chewing at the coast spread when man dug oil and gas canals to tap into the ridges below, allowing salt water to invade. Unless the process is somehow reversed, an LSU study finds the South Louisiana of today could look more like this in the year 2100. Coastal towns wiped off the face of the earth, other parishes left as ribbons of asphalt surrounded by levees. The state's new coastal master plan envisions a different future. A $50 billion blueprint spread over half a century aims to stitch back together at least parts of South Louisiana a mosaic of barrier islands, marsh, ridges, and man-made structures to defend against storm surge. Mining the Mississippi River for land building material, reconnecting the river to the marsh to quench the thirst for fresh water. Right. Our hope is our kids can still be living here yeah. 50 years from now or whatever. Yeah. That's the problem. My baby girl told us she wants the house. Yeah. We, we have to get out now. We hope she still has a house, you yeah. know? Oh, no. Four houses over there. Now they're gone, all four of them. In the South Louisiana of the early 21st century, the sea draws ever closer. We tend to think of the Louisiana map as permanent. Build a camp, build a city someplace, and that's it. Nature takes a different view. In fact, much of this place we call home was always meant to be temporary. As recently as 4,600 years ago, the land we're on today mostly didn't exist. Lake Pontchartrain was a shallow bay with a small peninsula to the east, the building blocks for modern New Orleans. 4,300 years ago, the river changed course toward New Orleans. Over the next few hundred years, East Jefferson became the river delta. Lake Pontchartrain was nearly closed off from the Gulf. Over the next 1,000 years, the river poured sand and dirt into the shallow waters. Land extended all the way out to the Chandelure Islands. 2,000 years ago, in one of the most dramatic events in Louisiana history, the river shifted back to the west, building the areas around Homa and Thibodeau. But land to the east, starved for river water, lost its battle with the sea. 
1,000 years ago, the river shifted course again, building what we now call Plaquemines Parish. No scientist talks about restoring us to the Louisiana map of the 1930s. There simply aren't enough resources, and that means more than just money. In fact, there's a huge debate over how to go about the business of recreating South Louisiana. <laughs> it looks like a big bunch of mud. Yeah, it looks so like... So much more. <laughs> <laughs> it's a giant mud flat. Just 12 miles from the French Quarter, Hillary Collins shows us a newborn island, less than a year old. <laughs> They call it the Muddy Mississippi River for a reason. Collis of the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana leads a group of volunteers planting cypress trees in an unlikely spot. On the St. Bernard Plaquemines Parish line, man stuck a straw into the river. The Carnarvon Freshwater Diversion Project feeds a portion of the Mississippi down a channel into the marsh. And in a shallow lake called Big Mar, islands have started popping to the surface. You know, the hard part's done. We've got the land. Bringing in plants and people to then secure it, that's the easy part. What's striking about this, as I walk across little bits of Iowa and Montana that have formed now a new part of Louisiana, is that this was never supposed to happen here, not in this place. The state's master plan for the coast envisions a couple dozen diversions, some small, some massive. If the Carnarvon today is a straw, the one that's planned there would be a faucet running at full blast, 250,000 cubic feet per second, or approaching the volume of the Bonnie Carey spillway. You cannot save this coast. You can't save the communities or the economies that it's built on, you know, if you're not allowed to effectively put water out there from time to time, and sometimes in big quantities. That's how it was built. It's going to be part of how it's managed. All that fresh water scares the daylights out of many people in the seafood industry. Oystermen complain the smaller diversions today have shocked the system. It is still going through um, too much fresh water at times, too much salt water at times, the mixture not occurring uh, quickly enough, so it's unstable. We know it's going to be detrimental. It's going to be the end of our industry. Standing on top of the existing diversion, oysterman Kenneth Fox argues Carnarvon actually hurt the brackish marsh in Breton Sound. You know, you look back here and you see, you see uh, some green, and we contend that, that it did a little good right here. But yet, you get a little further to the back, there's 18,000 acres that was destroyed by this thing after Katrina. Critics argue this is not Mark Twain's river. The modern Mississippi would channel fertilizer and industrial runoff into sensitive areas. All you're going to do is convert the marsh further downstream. The salt and brackish marsh down in Point Lash, that'll all be converted to fresh marsh. First hurricane comes along, wipes it out. Shallow root systems. Opponents of diversions are pushing for a greater emphasis on dredging, mining river mud, and pumping it into the marsh. You got to understand that this, this river that built this delta, you can't, you can't reconnect that river to the marsh no more because the silt is not in there. In fact, an LSU study found roughly half the river's historic mud flow gets trapped behind hundreds of locks and dams on rivers that flow into the Mississippi. It never gets here. Precisely, supporters say, why we need a mix of dredging and diversions to produce the most land at the cheapest price. We can't afford the pump sediment everywhere. We have to use the river where we can. Build all the land you want, they say, but fail to have the right fresh and salty mix, and the new land will simply erode away, like billions of dollars melting into the sea. The state did take a, 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 an approach to pick projects that had the best chance of surviving. But here's where it gets dicey. Take the saltwater marshes and islands near the Gulf. Too far from rivers, their only possible salvation is dredging. The current plan envisions spending $50 billion over half a century, which sounds like a lot of money. But it forces tough decisions about what to save and what to sacrifice. It is more honest about what we can do, who we can do it for, and actually how much it will cost. Tulane environmental law expert Mark Davis believes we need to set expectations based on how much money is available. Most people are willing to live with water going where nature sends it. But when you have to decide whether you're going to send water someplace based on a political decision, that becomes very tough. 
Davis points to the river floods of last year to show how managing a system can work if people know the risk up front. And that's exactly what happens in the Atchafalaya and Morganza. Every landowner gets a letter reminding them that they have flowage easements on their property and when push comes to shove, water's coming. Then I think you really see that people can adjust. Oysterman Steve Wassan knows doing nothing is not an option. Yet yeah, the paradox is if we do nothing, it, it might all go away. Right, that's right. So I'm in favor of doing something because of that, for the people's sake, for our sake. I mean, we need a place to live. That will mean finding the best way to turn back on the Mississippi River plumbing system that built South Louisiana. Now the question of how the state pays for all this. Where do they possibly come up with $50 billion? To arrive at that number, the State Office of Coastal Protection relies on a number of sources, beginning with potential fines from the BP oil spill. And then in 2017, Louisiana starts to get a larger share of federal money from offshore oil and gas royalties. What they're trying to do is narrow down uh, some realistic goals that can be done assuming that we raise $50 billion in 50 years, which is an average of a billion a year, which is still very, very aggressive. I mean, uh, we don't know if that, that's even close to reality. Coastal planners concede at best the $50 billion is an educated guess. Coming up on Disappearing Defenses, why the government aims to shut down one coastal project even though it seems to be working. A federal and state task force is moving ahead with plans to close one coastal restoration project, even though supporters insist it's working. In the West Bay Diversion near Venice, man has harnessed the power of the Mississippi to build new land. Unless somebody can solve a funding issue, the government aims to pull the plug. What are you, what are you getting there, Albertine? Um, probably about a foot right here. And a year, two ago? Five foot. In West Bay, Albertine Kimball strikes bottom. That tells you that the river's working for us. <laughs> the river appears to have built a mini delta with blazing speed. Ten years ago, the Corps cut a hole in the levee to free a portion of the river and build marsh. Not much happened. At first, the project was deemed a failure. But then supporters point out the Corps used some river mud to fashion a man-made island a couple miles away a sort of backstop that slowed the flow from the river. The 2011 spring floods did the rest. Sandbars started popping to the surface, then entire islands. Today, plant life blankets 30 acres of new land. From the air, you see more potential land, inches below, poised to spring to the surface. I think it's awesome. I think uh, it shows that diversions are working. But the original deal with shipping companies requires the project to cover the cost of any navigation issues. Siphoning water from the river at least partly caused a nearby ship anchorage to silt in. The importance of navigation is often lost in some of these reports. Dredging that anchorage would run $20 million every three years, siphoning money from other coastal projects. This is a lot, lot of money in one space, and we just cannot afford to continue to invest that money. So a state and federal task force has voted to pull the plug on West Bay, or in this case, put the plug back in the levee. The Corps does have other plans for West Bay, including a sort of giant vacuum cleaner. The Wheeler keeps the river channel deep enough for ship traffic, one of the world's largest hopper dredges sucking mud from the bottom. Trap doors in the dredge open to deposit the contents in a holding area in the river, until another dredge pipes that black gold into the surrounding marsh. We coincidentally had a public notice go out recently to go ahead and expand our beneficial use site to cover all of this area here in West Bay for future use if we have to place more dredge material there. In the last 35 years, the Corps has built 13,000 acres of new land through what's called beneficial use, including land on the East Bank across from West Bay and we have actually filled up that entire area that used to be open water, and that land has remained, um, and that's, that's about 2,000 acres that we've created there, and it has remained, and it's still in place. Parish officials applaud the new focus on West Bay, but they are still apoplectic over plans to kill a river diversion that's working. You know, now we're talking about many diversions on the river, but we're gonna close this one. 
Let's get it right. Without the diversion, a core study finds the anchorage will silt in anyway. The diversion is only partly responsible for the problem. Money is the whole problem, supposedly, but I thought we were trying to make marsh. The Corps estimates closing down the West Bay Diversion will cost $12.5 million. Two years ago, the Louisiana brown pelican became the poster child of the BP oil spill. The populations seem to have come roaring back, but there's trouble down the road, and the pelican is trying to tell us something. In one of the most remote spots in Louisiana, a population explodes. State wildlife biologists estimate as many as 8,000 pelicans are nesting on Raccoon Island. And this year, it apparently is the, is the greatest nesting colony in the state, and probably along the Gulf Coast for that matter. There are half a dozen major colonies in Louisiana. In the long term, most of these homelands are in trouble. And unlike other species, biologist Mike Carlos tells us pelicans like to nest at home even if the place is washing away. They want to live where they were born. This summer, the state plans to build 50 acres onto Raccoon Island to give the neighbors a little breathing room. 80 miles to the east on Pelican Island, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration adds real estate. NOAA's Rachel Sweeney shows us a $45 million repair job. This land right here that we're standing on was built literally within the last week. Since 2000, NOAA and the state have partnered to stitch back together a 20-mile stretch of barrier islands. Somebody might look at this and say, it's great, but another storm's going to come and blow it all away. Uh, why bother? Well, what we're seeing is in areas that we've rebuilt our barrier islands, as opposed to adjacent areas that they weren't rebuilt, the areas that have not been restored are completely decimated and have returned to open water. Sweeney says they designed the projects with storms in mind. On the island's backside, man-made marsh gives the beach and sand dunes a place to relocate as a storm blows through. It supports the island as storms come and it rolls back. So, so the island will roll onto, onto the marsh. The marsh. It's by no means permanent. NOAA projects this new land will have a life of 20 years. The issue of Louisiana's land loss can be so large, it's, it's difficult to wrap your arms around it. A couple years ago, we started following the story of one island as it steadily falls into the sea. It's in the southern part of Barataria Bay, a little speck of land locals call Cat Island. According to their map, this was land. Kerry Kose steers a Plaquemines Parish port boat in open water, which confuses his GPS. The GPS is telling us we're, we're on the island that used to be here. Instead, we're 150 yards offshore. We should be in the middle of it right now. We should be sitting on the island with the birds. Louisiana's Cat Island was in trouble long before BP's well, 60 miles to the southeast, blew out. One of the hardest hit spots during the Gulf spill, the pelicans here were among the first to take on oil. As I look at it, it, it looks as though since the spill, it's lost a football field or maybe two. Oh, easily a football field. Plaquemines Parish Coastal Director PJ Hahn has watched Cat Island melt into the sea. You know, every time you come out here, you're struck by what's not I here anymore. I, I keep saying it can't get worse and it gets worse. As late as 1998, this barrier island stretched 40 acres in a wide circle. The latest survey from the U.S. Geological Survey in December measured the island at one acre. And now you have just this ribbon that passes right through here. Exposed to tropical storms and everyday wave action, Cat Island also suffers some of the worst subsidence of any spot on the coast. It is literally sinking. You can see the oil right up against the root system. There's, there's our problem right there. Plaquemines officials believe oil only accelerated the cancer chewing away at the island. As we look at this island, BP didn't take 39 acres of this island. This no. island was almost gone the, the, before BP. Correct. So you can't just you can't just throw this on BP. Oh, no, 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 and we're certainly not. We're, we're, but what's happened is it's accelerated the life of this island by, you know, it's taken about 10 years off the life of this island. The first time we came out here two years ago, this was a separate island about the size of a football field. It quickly shrank to, say, carport sized, and these little mangrove trees, three or four peeking through the surface, are about the only evidence that there's anything here. We're pretty sure this is the last time we'll see this island. 
Here was that smaller island in January. Here it was in April, a lone pelican clinging to a mangrove. But parish officials are moving to restore Cat Island. The state has agreed to fund more than $1.2 million to pump sand and dirt back onto the island. Step one, build some kind of barrier around the island to cut down on wave action. And then the long-term plan is to either bring it back to what it was or build several islands around it. We're going to save this island, there's no doubt about it. Parish officials concede they lack the luxury of time. One good wind could blow away what's left of Cat Island, Louisiana. Coming up on Disappearing Defenses, some little-known success stories along Louisiana's coast, including an accidental Eden. For centuries, cypress trees offered some of Louisiana's best natural defenses against hurricanes. Entire forests have been wiped out, either by a logger's axe or through saltwater intrusion. But in recent decades, one success story has gone largely unnoticed. On the shores of Maurepas, giants rise to dominate the landscape. Jurassic-like, they grow to become the largest and oldest living things east of the Mississippi, if only given the chance. We can recover this one. Paul Kemp steers through a bayou in the Maurepas Wildlife Management Area through one of the last great stands of Louisiana cypress. A lot of the people who really liked this area understood that it, it, you know, they had to do something to protect it. Over the last three decades, one piece at a time, conservation groups and the state have patched together a string of wildlife areas now preserved. The newest addition, 29,000 acres leased by the Conservation Fund. In all, it forms 220 square miles of protected swampland. The ultimate objective um, is to connect these habitats. No one connect, claims they, they, total they victory. Connection. Ray Herndon you know, of the Conservation Fund knows uh, it's a lot. war half won. Uh, this looks really healthy here, but there are areas that, that are in deep jeopardy. There are, there are, and there are great plans uh, that are, you know, in, in various stages in contemplation, and, and I think, you know, on the cusp of actually being uh, implemented. Paul Kemp conducted the original research on plans to bring a drink of fresh water to this treasure. Two projects to divert a portion of the Mississippi River flow, including one along the Hope Canal. Sometimes the best things happen by accident. And that's certainly the case with the most successful land building effort in Louisiana. Look at what happens when we get out of the way. In the one spot where the river system is building significant new land, not some demonstration project, but thousands of acres. In the battle of land and sea, for once, land is winning. At the end of the Wax Lake outlet, a man-made channel, nature has taken over and created what Field and Stream magazine called an accidental Eden. Rarely has a clump of mud looked quite so appealing. Who knows where it came from? some of the three dozen states that drain into the Mississippi River system. But from the air, you see a paradise built on little grains of sand and dirt. Behold, the Wax Lake Delta. Mike, this is incredible. I mean, Wonderful this. place. <laughs> Wildlife and fisheries biologist Mike Carlos shows us where land meets sea. In this case, where it pushes sea farther to the south. Right. Overall, you look at coastal Louisiana, it's a, it's a bad story, and it, it's, um, it's quite depressing when you're dealing with, with the resources that utilize these wetlands, but you come out here and it's, it's the exact opposite. Our story begins in 1941. The Army Corps of Engineers, looking for a way to spare Morgan City future catastrophic flooding, cuts a new pass from the Atchafalaya, a straight shot to the Gulf, to siphon 30% of the river's flow. On the surface, not much happened at first. So the flood of 73 happens. There's a giant plug of mud, exactly. silt and mud that comes down, and suddenly land, new delta. Land begins to pop and, and new delta forms. Here is what the Wax Lake Delta looked like in 1941. Here it is today, 30,000 acres of new Louisiana. The boundary kind of indicates what the historic shoreline used to be. 
It's happened mostly during the lifetime of 31-year-old Cassidy Lejeune. Oh, I think it's uh, definitely a, a, the bright spot on the coast. There's, there's really nothing else like it. Channels that are hard to get through currently that maybe five years ago you could run a boat through. The mudflats are impressive, but what blows you away are the brand new forest a couple miles to the north. We walk on an island that did not exist in the 1970s where willow trees tower above us. And I think most people probably would have said, you know, we might be able to do some kind of marsh creation out of this, but probably had no idea of what, you know, the magnitude of that. And that nature would And the over. nature, right. You know, you build it and they'll come, especially if you do it naturally. <laughs> the Corps regularly dredges the Atchafalaya and Mississippi and picks spots for man-made islands. In the Wax Lake Delta, nature calls the shots. At the Gulf, mudflats turn to lily pads, then to marsh grass. Sandbars morph into islands. We can duplicate in restoration somewhat, but we can't do what, uh, what nature creates itself. Nature, left to its own devices, weaves together its own masterpiece. You know, we saw the trees down there that have grown up in 20 and 30 years. Um, how long before there are trees here? It, it depends, but very, you can see we're becoming an emergent marsh here on this flat, and it could be a very short time, within five years or so, you'll get little seedlings of willow trees popping up, and uh, in, in 10 years, you could have a little, a little forested island. Mike Carlos believes Wax Lake has powerful implications for other parts of the coast. This is what is possible. We have the sediment load coming down the Mississippi and Atchafalaya rivers. There's a lot of possibilities here in creating marsh. That does not mean it'll work everywhere. The Chafalaya Bay was only about five feet deep, and it does not suffer the same level of subsidence as many other sections of Louisiana. So about three feet of land where there had been five feet of water. Right. We got eight feet of height here. Do the math. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty incredible. And in one spot on the map, with a little help from man, nature builds an accidental paradise. The Wax Lake Delta shows us the power of a river as land builder. In this epic battle of land and sea, man has altered the odds in favor of the sea. From Lafayette to Thibodeau to Lake Charles, Louisiana's Tab Benoit captures what's at stake, perhaps as well as anyone, a way of life at risk of being lost forever. When I feel in the pain, the bayou's calling my name, and that's an offer that I can't refuse. As this unique place vanishes before our eyes. Set us home to miss you, Louisiana, when a Cajun man gets the blues. I set us home, Lord, to miss you. Fox 8 is proudly locally owned.